welcome back. Um, are you all having a nice afternoon? Stimulating, thought-provoking, challenging? I like it. Um, I'll, I'll try not to ruin all of that in the next 15 minutes. Um, I'm Margaret Robertson, as it says. I uh, help run a game studio in London and, and now in New York uh, called Hide and Seek. And I'm going to be hosting the session that we've got this afternoon, which uh, tackles the huge breadth of the ways in which games are interacting with cultural spaces. Um, I know from uh, a lot of the work that we've done in the, in the past few years that um, cultural spaces have often been at the vanguard of embracing the possibility of games at a time when games have spent a lot of time trying to construct arguments for their utility and for their value. Actually, one of the places where they haven't necessarily had to fight for that recognition has been in cultural spaces, has been in some of the, the more rarefied venues um, around the world. And over the course of the next hour and a half, we have six talks covering every aspect that you can think of of uh, that territory, looking at the ways games are being used in museums, in libraries, the, the kind of play experiences that are being created, uh, the kind of educational and, and, and social change values that are being embedded in them, the ways that we're, they're being used to harness creativity. So I will run you through the course of the, of, of the afternoon and see how far that takes us. Um, but I'm kicking things off, um, talking about legs, not fingers. I feel like I should have a, like a dance or a gesture or something to go with that, but I didn't, I didn't work that out ahead of time, unfortunately. Um, and I wanted to talk about this really based on the experiences that, that we've had designing in the, in the last three or four years um, at, at looking how to best take games into a, a wide variety of venues. We've done a lot of work uh, with uh, galleries and museums and uh, town centres uh, uh, and those kind of spaces. Um, and what's been interesting for me is that my background is, is video games. My background is digital. That's, that's where I come from. That's what I know. And um, a lot of the work that we do at Hide and Seek is digital. This is a, a, an iOS um, sort of arcade game that we made uh, in collaboration with the Royal Opera House in the UK, a very venerable uh, arts institution, uh, that was just a pure single player, hopefully fairly narcotic uh, video game fun. And we've taken that thinking into other cultural spaces. So um, this is Tate Trump's. Um, Sharon and Jackson coming up to talk about other Tate uh, projects after me, um, which was a, um, a site-specific digital game, so designed to be played, again, uh, on iOS devices um, in the museum itself. And um, we've had a lot of very positive experiences doing that. A lot of what you're going to hear about this afternoon will be about very positive experiences of, of using digital play uh, in these kind of places. Um, but. It's also given us first-hand experience of the complexities and the limitations that producing digital content um, can throw up, um, particularly when you're collaborating with, with these kind of institutions. Um, in that, there is a cost issue there, that there is there are just a, a, a set of requirements about producing anything digitally that's often quite expensive. Um, there's a set of accessibility questions. Um, in terms of what devices you're going to make your project accessible on, on whether or not the people who you are most trying to reach have access to those devices, whether or not the institution that you're working with is willing to maintain a stock of devices to provide access to people who wouldn't otherwise be able to get access. And often quite a lot of headaches about legacy, about when do you stop paying for this thing? What do you do when an, a new version of iOS comes out and somebody needs to update the logos or do a bunch of bug fixes? What do you do about the ongoing community management um, because you're starting to get a set of bad reviews because something isn't working? Um, how do you maintain the relationship between the institution and the game creator long term to deal with those situations and how do you manage the finances? So none of, none of these, these questions are, are particularly startling or necessarily insoluble. But they do present some challenges, particularly for smaller institutions. And, and we've had a, a set of very interesting conversations over the last couple of years with um, smaller uh, museums and, and, and galleries um, around the world, trying to, wanting to do games, so excited about games, looking to iOS, not least because often it's where the people looking to commission are playing themselves is the kind of game experience they know best, but not quite <coughs> being able to find their way through those particular difficulties. 
which for us then is really interesting because our territory, our heritage, is in physical space play. So Hide and Seek founded the first um, street game festival in the UK. We still run a bunch of events every year. Um, a lot of them are called Sandpits, which are uh, kind of fairly small scale um, games for uh, uh, settings for new games work, so games still in development or that have, have just been launched. And we run those um, nearly always in cultural spaces. They're more interesting when we run them in cultural spaces. So at the South Bank Centre in London, or the, this, this lady in the magnificent cardboard hat is at the National Maritime Museum in Greenwich in London. And we've been exploring in the last um, couple of years what happens when you make those things really small or you make them really big. So this is tiny games. Uh, we're now rolling this out across the whole of London. These are one-sentence games that we install on vinyl floor mats um, in urban areas that just exist unattended, um, little provocations to play, little game ideas, little rule sets uh, that people just encounter uh, as they go about their business. Um, and we've also taken it to the opposite end of the scale. So, oh, oh I pressed it twice. No, I didn't. Uh, this is the New Year Games. We ran this in Edinburgh uh, on New Year's Day this year. Uh, this was a citywide game for 12,000 players uh, where we had games running in all of the major venues in the city. This is um, a Minotaur game in uh, St. Giles Cathedral. Um, this is a game that we ran in the National Museum of Scotland uh, with a Scottish artist called Peg Spotoff who designed the, who we worked with to design the game and who designed all of the fitments. So we've, we've kind of run the gamut of doing every scale of physical scale game um, you can think. And it's really brought home to me the value that that approach has to offer within a cultural framework. For, and I, I kind of picked three reasons that I think are particularly interesting. One is, is looking at the, at, at the building, looking at the space you've got as a design platform, thinking really clearly about um, what affordances it gives you um, as, a, as a designer and specifically as a game designer. We, um, we are launching tomorrow in Paris, um, along with a, a bunch of other designers, I'm sure some people here may already be involved or, or will be working with people who are, there's a, um, an art centre there called Le Gaetier Larique, who's which is running uh, a big games exhibition all summer. And we were asked to design a game for that space and instead designed a game about the building. The, ga the game is entirely about um, interacting with the building, with understanding the, the building's heritage. The build it's called The Building Is. The building's pretty moody, is what we've discovered. It's kind of grumpy and old um, and a bit annoyed at all of these little itchy people running around inside it doing unpredictable things. Um, and so we started there rather than with any other idea um, and designed a set of games that have you interacting with all of the building's different senses and trying to change its mood. I would show you more, but we are literally still building it uh, for launch tomorrow, so I can um, share that with you all at a, at a later date. And that, I think, is another really critical thing that, that came... We learned a lot working on the Tate project um, around this, and it's still something that um, feels really important to us, is not necessarily overlaying the building and the, the content that it houses with your own stories or your own ideas. I think I've worked on a lot of projects uh, for games for cultural spaces where you're looking to come up with your, with your own narrative, with, you know, there's, there's a heist or there's a murder mystery or there's some other story that's driving your engagement. And my nervousness with those is always that they start to take the focus off the content that is already there, off this incredibly rich resource um, of material, whatever that is, whether that's books or, um, or, or artifacts or paintings. Um, and so the, the game we did for Tate Modern, although it's a, a digital format game, was designed that you play it barely by looking at the screen. The, the idea that we would send anybody into an art gallery to do this seemed really sad. And, and similarly with anything physical that we do, the idea that we would do anything to get in the way of people's engagement with the space that they've come to experience seems um, problematic to me. And a, and a lovely example of this is a, is a game that uh, a woman called Sophie Sampson, who, who's a hide-and-seek collaborator, uh, made. 
uh, called the House of Shadows, which was tremendously simple, which was just a, um, a game for the v &A galleries in London, where you were searching for silhouettes of objects. Um, and sometimes they were very representative of the thing itself. Sometimes they become very abstracted because they only exist at a certain angle um, and a certain way of looking at the thing. And, and watching people play was a lovely exercise in watching people utterly engaged in the space and with the objects that they were looking for, that it was impossible to progress in that game without being fully focused on the environment that you were in and everything that you were looking at. Um, and seemed like a really good object lesson in, in how to do uh, games that um, emphasize rather than distract from um, the content that they're sitting alongside. And I think another thing that we're still learning um, when you're thinking about doing physical space games, um, but that is incredibly important, is we're used to thinking about designing games so that players don't adversely impact on the environment. So one of the things we had to think about in designing the, the game for Tate Modern, one of the things we often have to think about in the games that we do are not having players become hooligans, not having players rampaging through um, the environment, detracting from everybody else's environment, being noisy, being loud, potentially damaging any of the, the material that um, surrounds them. But there's also an issue about designing games so that they are legible to an outside observer. And this is hard and interesting and, and useful. That we know from a lot of our work that it's easy to design games where you stop and look at the people who are playing because they're wearing crazy cardboard hats or they're, uh, or they're running around or they're talking in strange languages, they're doing something else. And you know they're having more fun than you are, but you don't really understand why, and you don't know how to get started, and you're actually maybe just a little bit intimidated. And thinking about how you need to design play experiences that are both really robust for the people playing them, but also intelligible and accessible for the people watching is a thing that we're at the very early stages of experimenting with and very eager to have interesting conversations about. Because when you get it right, it solves one of your biggest problems. You don't, it's always great if you can have loads of signage up about a, a game that you're running or um, present a lot of information uh, that gets people to come and start playing. But you can't, again, you run into longitudinal problems. You can maybe have that around launch, you can maybe staff the game for a week or a month and have people there to encourage people to get involved. But um, you can't necessarily do it for any longer than that. So um, in the same way that we're used to designing virally digitally, if you're making a Facebook game or, you, or you're making something online, um, I think anyone in this room would be thinking now about, you know, how does that manifest in your social graph? How do you, what are the recruitment mechanisms that start bringing other people into play? How do you make this visible? other people's walls. You need to be applying that kind of thinking to thinking about physical space games um, of do you want people to be pulled in? Do you want um, to ensure that the game continues to kind of generate its own momentum and that, that people um, come pass it from one person to the next? So the thing that we found is these are often more robust, more adaptable, <coughs> Uh, more irresistible to people in the environment, um, but are not so well understood in terms of being something that you can commission and something that um, is necessarily going to work well in your space. So I just I wanted to kick this off by really by just reminding everybody that there's a, there's um, a really broad spectrum of ways in which games can operate um, in these environments um, and that they're not necessarily just digital or not solely digital and that um, legs, not fingers, which, you see, see, if there'd been a dance, that would have been perfect, but there wasn't a dance. This is, this is what I've learned, is that there should be a dance. So that's my kind of opening statement. Um,